and bodies were left lying in the road. The lines of troops across the entrance to the square regrouped as the injured were raced away on any available transport. Despite the horror of the killings, one abiding image seemed to capture the sense that the world was changing. One small person was stopping a whole row of tanks in China and it really did feel like things were possible. All sorts of amazing things were happening in the world. You know, you'd see people in an Eastern Bloc country all gathering in a central square with candles and then their government collapsing and freedoms everywhere. You know, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, everything seemed to be suddenly this huge surge towards freedom. And there are red. But some things never change. Britain remained a class-ridden society and Royal Ascot was the parade ground for the privileged. Ascot was still very much the province of the kind of private punter rather than a morass of corporate entertaining. And so that was still pretty special to get into the royal enclosure, which that year was, if I remember rightly, all black and white. I love these, black and white, very smart. Again, you see more black and white, that's a very smart suit. In 1989, the corporate hospitality industry was worth 500 million pounds. A passport to privilege could now be paid for. Britain was getting a little bit more like America, where people were footloose and fancy free and where money could buy you position, money could buy you the things that you wanted. One of the big things about the, the, the summer of 1989 and to do with... You know, the celebrity event of the summer of 89 was the wedding of Rolling Stone Bill Wyman to his 19-year-old bride, Mandy Smith. The sex antics of Rockstar are meat and drink to uh, pigs like the sun. Bill Wyman's 53. Mandy Smith's 19, and they had known each other for a few years before, if you get my drift. Not only it was that an unutterable disgrace, but right? even worse than that is that Mandy Smith's mother starts going out with Bill Wyman's son. It was the original celebrity wedding. Anyone who was anyone was there. The wedding was fabulous. Don't let's kid ourselves, you know. I mean, we had a fantastic time. When can you sit down and have a chat with the, the Rolling Stones, you know? And everybody was there. Everybody was there. It was just a great atmosphere. Lovely to be here, mate. I couldn't resist this, Bill. I couldn't resist this. It was the first of those real celebrity weddings that sort of made it into every broadsheet as well as the kind of, you know, the fan magazines. It was extraordinary. It was only right that celebrity worship would need its own Bible. Hello magazine had just hit the newsstands and devoted 14 pages to the wedding photos. When you look at the Beckham wedding, which happened, what, about five or six years later, <clears throat> and then the Jordan wedding, which is the ultimate, I mean, you can't get any further than that, the Jordan and Pete wedding. The Mandy and Bill wedding was the first of those kind of great weddings, and it was, in a way, the first wedding which should have happened in the next decade. One group seeking to avoid media exposure were the rave promoters. But despite their best efforts, the scene was about to be blown wide open. On the hottest night in June, an aircraft hangar in Berkshire was transformed into a wonderland of throbbing sound and state-of-the-art laser lighting. Hidden among the 11,000 guests was a team of undercover reporters from The Sun. On Monday morning, the party was front-page news. A friend of mine said to me, have you seen the papers today? And I was like, well, what do you mean? He said, go and buy the sun. And there was this, for the first time, the first time the general public got to hear that this was going on. It was a great story for tabloids for one important reason. You could either read it as saying, God, I wish I was there. I'm going to go to the next one, right? Or the older readers could say, bloody disgraceful. They're disgusting what's going on in our country. Something must be done. The Sun piece was full of outlandish details, including the claim that there were thousands of ecstasy rappers littering the floor of the hangar. 
Actually, what that was, we had this really brilliant firework that went off and it um, showered everyone with these lovely silver, you know, bits of silvery paper, so it looked like it was raining silver. But anyway, that was the, um, the e ecstasy wrappers on the floor. Of course, there are some people who say that ecstasy doesn't turn up in wrappers. Now, I'm slightly too old to know whether that's true or not. All I can say is, if the sun said it was true in 1989, then it was definitely true, as we were selling 4.3 million copies per day, and we were the Bible of choice for young people. Suddenly, Middle England was up in arms about this new disturbance of the peace. Soon, questions were being asked in Parliament. I remember a huge tabloid frenzy. At the heart of the frenzy and the exaggeration was a real problem which was really one of surprise. People went to bed in some sleepy village, there was a barn uh, next door or a, a, an empty house, and suddenly in the middle of the night, there was this huge noise, cars, people shouting, music, loud music, drugs, um, and something quite unexpected had hit them, and they were very frightened. With raves, I suppose you, in one sense, you can say, well, this is, this is a free society very free um, but you might also argue it's freedom gone mad at midnight and after um, and that's really what people were complaining about an abuse of freedom by now the entire tabloid press wanted a slice of the story and the rave scene was being branded as a serious threat to the authority of mrs thatcher's government in May, Mrs Thatcher seemed invincible. By the end of July, everything seemed to be crumbling, especially the fact that she couldn't control her own country. She talked a lot about the enemy within and about youth as a danger. Um, and here we were, running riot, the police trying everything they could to stop us, and nobody able to. The police were no longer taking a lenient approach towards the raves. They and the promoters became engaged in an increasingly elaborate game of cat and mouse. It was almost like a competition, you know, we'd put on the party, they'd try and stop it, and it was, you know, it was the best man wins. The organisers went to extraordinary lengths to throw the police off their trail. We actually sent two decoy lorries out two hours in advance of the actual real sound systems in completely the wrong direction to where the party was happening, and it worked. They were followed by the police. And they took them round the M25. And then after the police had gone, the two real lorries out the door to the venue. Thank you very much. We never knew where the parties would go and take place. So we had to be as wise and adept as them at getting the manpower out. So we worked on the principle that at any one time we could muster up to three to four hundred police officers. Now the idea of that was if we could muster four hundred police officers in the first hour, we could stop a party. We had a copy at some point of the police manual which said if there's 2,000 people in a warehouse, do not intervene because it will cause a riot. So our objective was to get, you know, a four-figure number of people in there, get the party going, knowing that the police were just trying to prevent ravers getting through. With the authority of the state seemingly under threat, the police started employing tactics that had last been used during the miners' strike. But the rave promoters had done their homework and they had lawyers on hand to argue their case. The police had blocked off the roads and they were not letting anyone through. So Evans said, right, we'll park our car and we'll walk to the rave. And the police were trying to stop them and our lawyer said, actually, you are not allowed to do that. And they knew that he was right. When roadblocks failed, the police tried a different tack. They knew the promoters would be crippled without their communication network. The police got clever and they started pressurising the phone companies and you'd see the phone companies would get their lines cut or suddenly become non-operational on a Saturday night um, and we'd have to use the pirate radio stations. That's another Saturday night. West Side people, yeah. It's essential. Get there early. So as we all know, the police are going to break it. Pirate radio stations were now the only way to announce party venues. The police decided two could play at that game. We set up.